part of what you're going to see tonight is the first time I've ever shown this show. And it actually um, was caused by a grotesquely illegal act on my part. Which was, I was driving up to a job site at the Berkshires, and just something came over me. It was like a brain hemorrhage or some form of you know, catatonic state. And I began to text a haiku poem sort of to myself, thinking about, the, thinking about where the world of architecture is. Essentially, I'd just been fired by a client for being too modern, and I had just had a project rejected for a competition because it was too traditional. So there was this great dynamic going in my head, and I began to realize that there are currents in the field of building which only become understood when sort of cataclysmic events that are non-aesthetic take over. The Industrial Revolution sort of allowed modernism to explode. I think, and you'll see here, the counterculture movement of the 60s allowed postmodernism to explode. I'm thinking that the economic cataclysm we've just had might make architecture and aesthetics in general rethink itself in terms of how it looks at buildings and culture and people and how they're used. And so essentially, my point tonight is to talk about the fact that for houses, and I am I are a house guy, for houses, basically what what we've got is but Leon Creer was talking to wrote a book, and he basically said, you know, what's a house? Well, it's pretty much all these things until 1930, and then it became that, and pretty much he's thinking 2030 will go back to being this. Well, this is the era where we are, right in here, where for architects, so this is really about Leon Creer, he's an architect, he's done in 88. For architects, as celebrated in the press, in competitions, in places other than Yesterborough and, some other, and a few other places, <laughs> architects are, I mean, houses are the ur building. They're the, they're the prototype that has no real size, it has no real occupant, it has no real site. It is, a, it is the essence of what a building can be, and that's why it's important. And playing off of that is essentially a huge housing industry which is now on its back in submission. Basically, 90, probably 99% of the houses in America are undesigned by architects. Some say 95, but basically, custom designed houses are a tiny percent of a tiny percent of the houses that are built in America today. And the way those houses are marketed is obviously like anything else with, with height, but using traditional architecture as the modus operandi to lube the skids to get people to buy something which probably is not the best value. And it's nothing new. This has happened really since the you know, sub suburbs exploded when the interstate highway system took over the landscape. And it, it continued on. This is a slide from uh, the Michael Kimber from Texas who had the show uh, another core event that we had, where essentially the landscape is carpet bombed to get the most number of dollars per square acre out of the pockets of potential housing consumers. Because the idea is, if you don't own a, a single family home on a plot of land, then you're missing the boat. And what that translates into is something which is a fairly sad, almost tragic, you know, suburban sprawl, where essentially the, <laughs> the, 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 where, where, where the owner and the site doesn't mean very much. Essentially, this could be these these little uh, you know McMansions, you know, or, or uh, burger houses, as, as an architectural direction was. So ranch burger houses basically can flood any landscape. They're designed for any client, and it really is undifferentiated. And the way they market them is through different styles, different pastiches of applied, you know, either ornaments or materiality, but something that actually is applied. The basic idea of the ur building, the house, the residence, so that you can actually sell it and market it through style. This is your style of a house, and typically they're old styles, they're not new styles. And this style line actually makes some interesting you know, connections to sites. That's actually a good photograph, it's not really But the alternative is really not that much better. The alternative is presented by the rest of the sort of elite media is the 1% solution, which is you know, too cool for school. The idea is that the, the, the mod architecture, the idea of the, of the cutting edge, innovative house, 
the, for, for the elite is essentially what has been propagated in architecture school. And now if you think I'm wrong, this is from a Yale uh, design studio in 2000. It's called, it's called the Millennium House. It was in theory a real site with a real budget and a real client, all of which turned out not to be true, but that's the school. And one of the students, one of the brilliant, gifted, graduate students of Yale, who has to have this as part of his or her design presentation of her house. And basically it says, I am the American dream. I am wasteful of materials, inefficient in my functioning, and rely on the desire to oppress and control others through the illusion of wealth and a false participation in a history that's anything but my own. And I showed this slide actually about seven years ago in Chicago. And an architect came up to me after the show and he said, wow, you know what? I designed that house. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for showing it. He was actually quite proud that Yale was dissing. Well, the alternative to that clearly dysfunctional, bloated, historic pastiche, disingenuous bit of pandering crap that is the, that is the typical American home <laughs> is really not that much better. It is basically the great tradition of architectural education and architectural elitism that basically says, well, architecture is this rarefied thing that really isn't about um, history, which, is, which can be distilled into a stylist, perfected world of architecture. Mm -hmm. Nor is it about technology. And by the way, this was an Apple iPod and this book was written. It was the coolest car going in 1920-something. You know. And but, but, and so what you know, Corbusier said was, if you take a look here, Corbusier said, uh, where is it? Uh, architecture abstraction has this about it, which is magnificently peculiar to itself. That while it is rooted in hard fact, it is spirit, it spiritualized because the naked fact is nothing more than the material, materialization of a possible idea. And houses really aren't ideas. They're buildings that house families. But in the architecture world, all buildings are about ideas. And the house is the most distilled, overarchingly present example of architecture. So, you know, this house was not so much a house as it was a composition using the golden mean in all these different little ways that Corp Cor could do it. And I was taught this in design school in 1973, where the year before I went to my freshman studio, this modular man was painted on the wall, full size, with all of these, oops, with all of these little things that tell you what it is. And basically, the freshmen had to design all their projects in the modular. Mm -hmm. On this way that the buildings were created that came from the mind of one architect as a better way to, this, to, to dimension and scale things beyond you know, the English system with the king's thumb or the meter that is from God knows what. So um, that falls into the reality that although there's this empirical, wonderful world of abstracted architecture, you know, architects like Mies van der Rohe are people too. And they're not heroic, they're normal people that want to distill some inner truth that's between his ears here and actually basically show it to other people. And that's a great way to create invention, progress, new thinking, but it also is isolated to those two ears and oftentimes ends up being just as capricious as fashion design. Just as celebratory of the star architect as any other, you know, hipster, groover, art culture icon that comes and goes, whether it's Warhol or Capote or anything else, the idea is if I can get a cool project in a cool place, I can be cool. The problem is that when you're dealing with houses, that's not really cool. That's not really something that people resonate with. That's why 1% of the buildings deal with that kind of a mindset and the rest of the population, 99%, is, is dealing with, the, with that. And that came up for questioning during the Cultural Revolution of the 60s and 70s. It came into questioning because the truth was that, that white males pretty much dominated, and that be me, by the way, lost white males in Ivy League schools pretty much were it. They were the, they were, they were the post-World War II. This was actually, we were going to rule the world. And the truth was, that was in, inherently unjust, irrational, stupid, wrong. And so a lot of the culture shifted. 
It changed, it, it basically the idea was, well, you know, people that aren't white are the U.S. citizens, they should be allowed to vote. People that aren't males should be allowed to have jobs. You know, there, there, was, there was so many things that were inherently wrong, it was, to me, identical to seeing a huge building made with steel clad in ornament to hide the steel. So the idea that you could have an industrial revolution where there are elevators and electricity and heating plants and indoor plumbing and you build it like a Greek temple is about as disingenuous as having architecture designed for people that are architects as opposed to people that are families. And this, this, this sort of culture revolution made people question everything. <laughs> So the idea is that when you question things, the non-aesthetic issues become aesthetic. When you talk about the, the basis of how we live our lives, what do we value, it always bleeds down into houses. And so the people began to question, well, do architects really know what a, what, what a, what a good building is? Do they, do, they really, do they really know what's safe and what gives comfort? Well, this book came out and Oscar Newman basically said, well, you know, kind of no, because the truth was that Pruitt Igo, even though there's a book out now saying if they only spent about a few hundred million more dollars on Pruitt Igo, it would have really been a great place to live. The truth was that when you're outside in these corridors that are that are open open air corridors, seven feet above grade with three light bulbs in it, you can pretty much get killed. So 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 essentially, they tore this building down. Charles Jenks sort of said they're tearing down modern architecture. The world has changed. We're never going to have this top-down philosophy again. It's going to be bottom-up. And you began to see things like site create buildings that intentionally sort of mocked the pretense of these large block buildings and sort of the, the ideas that they, they were actually in dynamic, cascading failure. You had, you had uh, artists take houses and literally deconstruct them to show that buildings are both uh, transitory, temporary, and at the same time you know, ineffably material as opposed to conceptual. And you had Robert Venturi, who retired last week as being an architect, and his wife, Denise Scott Brown, look at, look at tackiness as high art and high evidentiary uh, realities of what popular culture means. And I also find it lovely that when they did this photograph, what was there was an icon, an old icon as opposed to the new icons. And they created the idea that architecture, which was so serious and so important, could actually have humor, could actually have irony, could actually have iconic references that weren't classic, but of the zeitgeist. And you'll hear these words in the presentation, the idea that architecture could be as fresh as a daisy and as timeless as, as, the, as the moon. And in that, humor, zeitgeist, whatever, came the hubris of the postmodernist movement that said, it's over. Modernism is done. We've seen the truth. Just like you know, women being not being allowed to go to business school and and black people down south not being allowed to vote, buildings should be designed not by the standards of you know Mies van der Rohe, but they should be designed by the standards of humanity at large. All the warts, all the different historical pretenses, all the fun stuff, all the humor. So you actually had humor come into it. And Leon and Ren Kulas made this book, and these icons become deliciously funny things, very unserious. It all becomes grist for the mill of social commentary. And that all just completely fell of its own weight because obviously when you take something that far, there's not much to sustain it and it wasn't really teachable and it was a strangely thin veneer of reinvention that had a lot of explosive appeal because it was different. It was the, it was the, it was the appeal of the dissonant. But in a time when we've had at least 30 years of lockstep, and I'll use the 60s word, hegemonic orthodoxy that has essentially said to architects, if you don't do modern work, you're pretty much a hack. Not for here, and not for in the world, but in the world of school and journalism, unless you're doing high modernist work, you pretty much are teaching intelligent design. Basically, you're teaching something which you know maybe denies evolution. So what's in response to that sort of incredibly oppressive, closed-minded, self-reinforcing construct, this, this exhibit uh, was, was formed in London last year. And it was incredibly successful, a huge catalog, because the truths of humor, irony, um, 
iconography, all these things that are present and real in our culture that are not reflected in, in the architecture that's mostly taught, those things are real. They're not, they're not, they, they, they can't be wished away with some sort of uh, cleansing uh, orthodoxy. So back in 1985, record houses had all types of houses in them. Back in 1985, 27 years ago, it basically had crazy modern sculptures, it had incredibly traditional things by Alan Greenberg, it had any number of different postmodernist things, it had some classical arts and craftsy things, it had 20, 18, 20 houses in it, all of them <laughs> did. And in 1985, they had my house in it. And they had my house because it was something they thought was kind of interesting. It fit into the larger tableau. It fit into a larger matrix of thinking about houses not just as one thing, as sculpture, or one thing as a solar engine, or one thing as a reproduction of a classical piece, or one thing as social commentary. They thought of architecture as being a synthetic art, the mother of all the arts, the mother of our culture, reflective of what we do as human beings, and this had a place at the table. Now, the last 20 years, has seen the number of houses shrink to 10 or 12, and has actually seen an incredible uh, mow mowing of anything but modernism. The idea is that anything other than this is illegitimate. It's intellectually bankrupt. It's not real. And the truth is that it reached, I think, here, here comes the part since nobody's paying me and can't take my fee away. Um, this was the high point. This was the high point of hubris. This, this house was actually put on the cover. This is the cover. This house put on the cover, and, and because of the way this works, it was probably selected in 2010, and it was probably built in 2008, and that meant it was built at the height of the building boom. It was built, I think, in Europe, or no, New Zealand, somewhere, but not here. And it has a stucco roof, and not only a stucco roof, but a stucco roof of the Yankee gutter. And it has a dog and a child living in the house, and the dog and the child cannot leave the house without a parent because they will die. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when, when well, you think about that, that is that is the Ur house. That is the that is the image of the of the Gable house. And what this also responded to, interestingly enough, was I gave a talk at an AI national convention about six or eight years ago, and I said I said I counted it up. The last five years, there have been I'm going to make these numbers up because I remember them. There have been 37 houses in, in architectural record, and three of them have had pitched roofs. They're all fine. Associate editor comes up to my uh, co-founder, Jeremiah Eck, about uh, six months later and says, no, 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 look, look, look. She hands him a paper. They actually they heard about this. They did an analysis. There were only two houses with pitch roofs in it. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, so what ends up happening is that you, you get this sort of defensiveness in, in the journalistic, journalism world. And basically, the editor in this magazine predetermined that, you know, we're going to catch some serious grief during the worst recession in the history of recessions. All caused, by the way, all caused by the American single-family house tanked the rural economy. And that's going to be added, that's going to be true. Um, what, what they were defending was, you know, we do these sort of pine sky houses, but, but the truth is, you know, we value functionality and code compliance. But you know, they are not the archetypal house, which reassures and relates to what has long been part of our lexicon. Meaning, we want to set forth a vision which is not what you want, but what we think you should think about. Well, something happened. So 2012, and my good friend is the second in command there. 2012, there was some sobering. They lost the contract to be the American Institute of Architects House Order. Went over to Architecture Magazine. Robert Ivey, who used to run Architecture Record, became AIA's chief executive. Architecture Record went from being three-eighths of an inch thick to about three-sixteenths thick. And that was all ad copy going away. They began to sort of talk amongst themselves. So they pretty much did what, you know, pretty normal cool stuff. And by the way, I love all these houses. There isn't a single house that's ever been an architectural record, I think should not be an architectural record. I think it is hilariously fun to put all this stuff together and look at it, find fault with it, find delight in it. It is all good. But it's become so boring that it's become less interesting, that it's become less significant. So they actually, Sarah Amalar, I don't know if you know, she's a great writer, she went out and found this house, 
here. And this house is the first house in at least 20 years, which actually has iconography, irony, humor, commentary, history, because those are jet airplane wings. And as part of the presentation, they showed this. Post-apocalyptic, salvaged, humorous, different, cool, not serious, architecture, you know, sculpture. <laughs> and what ends up happening is it betrayed, it broke, I think, it has broken the code of silence that was put up by the, by the profession since postmodernism, which is deeply embarrassing to serious art. That, that when you think about the American house, and this is actually done, by the way, in 1985, it's a sort of meaningless pastiche of hackney tripe, which actually is done for marketing and actually done to pan to the lowest common denominator so we can sell more houses. And the interiors are all these little bits and pieces that are so mockable. It's like clubbing a baby seal. It doesn't give up much resistance. These are pretty heinous and stupid things, but they don't represent, they don't represent what iconography, humor, materiality, history can do, they represent what people do who want to make a lot of money, and they distort values that are real into something which is marketable. So you get the collision. <laughs> you get the collision of the static, entrenched 1% elite. If you don't understand me, you're an idiot. And you basically get the, but we just want to live in a nice house. And the two only collide. They don't mutually infuse each other. Well, as I said at the beginning of this, what changes perception in aesthetics are non-aesthetic things. Things that architects and artists and sculptors do not think about. They happen because they have to happen because they're real. They're hard-edged. They change the way we perceive the world, and the way we perceive the world is how we make buildings. When we started thinking about houses as commodities we could buy, and then resell at a 15% greater value any time we ever wanted to, it became so distorted that it tanked the world economy. And this meltdown that we're having is, or, and we're still having it, by the way, it hasn't gone away. This meltdown, this, 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 this greatest recession in the history of recessions, has permanently changed the way we think about our lives. We, we thought here, well, you know, I might buy a house, I might sell it someday, and say, oh my gosh, I can actually make a lot of money. Oh my gosh, no matter what I do, I'm going to make a lot of money. I better buy that house really quick or I'm going to lose a lot of money because then we'll get, and then, and then this. Crash, crash, crash. Now this is put out by the National Association of Homeowners. This chart was made in 2011. The National Association of Homeowners said, Oh yeah, we're coming out of this, baby. We're coming back big and strong. It's going to happen for us. And uh, what happened was that, you know, in 72 there was a boom, and then in 75 there was a bust. In 77 there was a boom. In 80 there was a bust. In 81 there was a boom. In 82 there was a bust. In 84 there was a boom. In 91 there was a bust. In 2006 there was a really big boom. And then there was a bust, and then there was a bust, and last December there was a bust, and we're basically making 300,000 new houses a year when we were close to two, we were close to three million houses a year. New houses being built. The industry is essentially dead. Do you realize that there's not a single national home builder in the Fortune 500? And there were seven of them in the 2008 Fortune 500. House building has ceased to be a profit engine. It's no longer manipulated in the way it was manipulated to make people want things that they maybe didn't know they didn't want. So what ends up happening is things like the Housing Misery Index by Trulia comes out, which basically has a delinquency on mortgage rates, and I think this is the number of houses that, 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 that essentially have gone on the market in terms of the percentage of, of the total marketplace. And you can see everyone is on the wrong side of the housing misery index. Yeah, you know, Alaska is not so bad. North Dakota is not so bad. The rest of the country, not so much. One out of every 624 households in January basically got a foreclosure notice in one month. Do you realize that one in seven American houses are empty? They are without humans in them. They're empty. 
you realize that one in five American mortgages are right now, today, <coughs> underwater? This is from New York Times about two months ago. That's a $700 billion hole in equity. And the average homeowner that, are, that is underwater is underwater by $50,000. And the average income of an American family is around $34,000, $38,000. So do the math. This is the sort of thing that kills magazines, kills media, kills books being published by Taunton, kills other schools other than this school. Because this sort of image of the modern machine goes away when you realize it's all basically the emperor's new clothes. Even dwell is morphing into nothing. And at one time it was incredibly hip. And this bleeds down to my profession, to us. To what are we going to do with the rest of our careers? What are we going to do to young men like that young man there who wants to be an architect? What's going to happen to you who might want to be architects? How is this going to change what you do? How are you going to be able to look at buildings in a way which actually people are willing to pay for? Well, I think it changes pretty normally because the truth is there are canons. There are things that people value and they are interpreted one way or another way or some third way. So in thinking about this in the car driving illegally to Massachusetts, <laughs> I began to think about why am I so freaked out by the idea that there is a modern world which is about architectural correctness and there is a traditional world which is still in marketing. Why is style being, being taken as A or B and both choices are wrong? Why is this disconnect present and what do I think about it? So I began to think about it. I began to think about what is important, what is the truth? Well, when I look at magazines and go to prints at, at Ivy League schools, the, the modernism is the truth. The rest is heresy, the rest is disingenuousness, the rest is you know, bourgeois, capitalistic crap. But when you talk to the traditional home builder dudes, actually the truth is profit. If I can make money, I don't really care about anything to do with style. If I can make money doing anything, it's all good. My reality is that buildings reflect values. So that's my reality. Buildings reflect values. Mm. And houses reflect very specific human values, like the Rose Cottage in the 16th century, <coughs> which had a very recent 19th century addition for a toilet. Right? They reflect the desire to be safe and comfortable and feel and look like we want them to feel no matter what that is. And that could be a spaceship, that could be a McMansion, that could be anything as long as it's who our family and we are. Well, Canon too. what about the people living there? What, what about the people that occupy buildings? Well, modernism, nah, it don't really matter. Marketing, nah, who cares? I mean, you know, if they pay the money, I don't really care who they are. And the modernist says basically, well, it's not about the, the occupants, it's not about the inhabitants, it's about the architect. So my reality, being a house designer, is home is where the heart is. That is why it's hard to teach. That's why it's hard to quantify. That's why it's hard to have a canon, because it's about the most sacred human basic possession we have, which is what protects us from that rain. Mm -hmm. Clients I've had for 25 years, built a $180,000 house them 25 years ago, I get an email from them every two or three months, talking about the house and what they're going to do. History. What about history? Well, architecture process, well, history is kind of an unseen, inevitable thing. If we rely on it, it's, it again, it's a crutch. It's, it's not what we should happen. We should essentially maybe build that history, but the truth is, if we look back, we're not moving forward. For the traditional guys, hey, I'll use history. I'll use whatever you want. I've got to make some money, so maybe, you know, I'll call this a colonial house. You want to I love colonial is great. It's old. It's cool. <laughs> Reality. History. You can't escape it. It's with us every day of the week, every minute of every day, and you can't invent it. It is or it isn't. It's beginning to be understood. I write for Architecture Boston. I think it's the best publication in architecture today. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm their lead blogger dude. And they basically have come to the conclusion that the world is shifting to. They're giving voice to people like Henry Moss, who's a lead guy. Basically says essentially that modernism and historic preservation, these sort of twin religions, are essentially deluding themselves about what buildings should be and how buildings should adapt and how the way buildings can change to meet 
what's happening in the world. Meaning beyond style. How do you get beyond style? Well, you know, if you talk to a modernist, you know, style is not, it's really not about style, it's about greatness and brilliance. But you know what? Even though we make things that have no actual size, you know, they're sustainable. They're rooted in something which is energy efficient and doesn't break the landscape, but reflects the human values of, of low carbon footprint and working against global climate change. And, and, but the truth is, it's still a sculpture and it costs too much money, and 1% of the people can afford it or want to live in it. The marketing is just a guy say, well, you know, um, beyond style, I don't really care. Let's curb appeal, makes quick sale, I'm done, we're good. My reality for houses is that buildings should comfort, no matter what style they are. Buildings should make you feel like you're out of the hail. They should make you feel the hail's coming in. Unfortunately, where I was taught, Peter Eisenman made a house that intentionally, intentionally made you uncomfortable. It had a stair you could use, and it has a stair that has a column that runs two feet above the middle run of the stair. So you would actually, you went up the stair, you'd walk right into the beams, the beams right across. The idea was, don't you get too comfortable now. Because the truth is, I control this thing. You don't. But the role is like this. What is zeitgeist? It's this ephemeral thing that happens. It's here in this room right now, the dynamic we're having. In fact, you're looking at this, and stuff is you hear things, you see things, you smell things, you eat things. Well, you know, Arthur Zagreca says, well, we're above that. We're like, we are, we are music that has no real relationship to anything in the popular culture. Marketing says, how can I make some money on that zeitgeist thing? What, what are people thinking about? How can I like grab something and make it into a hype? Uh, green? Yeah, we'll make a green 7,000 square foot house with floors from Brazil. Yeah! <laughs> All zeitgeist in reality is local. It's what people feel when they're there with buildings. What, what, what is happening in their lives, especially in houses, what's happening? Have their children moved away to college? Have, are, there, are their parents going back to live with them? Do they really don't want, they don't want to have a building they have to paint every three months? I mean, what is their reality? Well, you know, zeitgeist is, well, if you're, well, if you're, in, if you're in New Orleans, uh, zeitgeist would be, well, maybe I'm Morphosis, I'm Tom Main, and maybe Brad Pitt's giving me a big fee, and, and I can make a house, which is actually a boat, we can float away in the next uh, flood. Well, that's kind of cool. There's even some decoration. There's, some, I think, some humor, some fun stuff going on. But again, this is uh, one of these. One, cool, interesting, cool, one. And Lois did a house. It was a lot more than one. Might have been probably more than 99. Actually served thousands and thousands of people for a small fraction of that house because, let's face it, Brad Pitt makes a lot of money. He doesn't make enough money to house all the people who lost their homes in Katrina. Canon 6, fitting in, fitting in, fit it. How do you fit? Well, for the architectural correctness modern world, context, what exists is always a foil for what is truth. What exists is what has been. What I'm doing is what is truth. I want to play off of that so that I, you, can, you can see the transcendent brilliance of my vision, which is not limited by time, space, material, or humans. <laughs> Marketing by a style. Well, context is kind of what we make it. Do you want to have like a traditional village? Do you want to live in a tower? Do you want to live, where do you want? I mean, I can make context. Context is good. I'll sell context. The reality is context is unavoidable. You can't manipulate it, and you can't deny it. It's there. It's a present phenomenon, and it has to be dealt with. Well, I wonder what that is. Uh, deep in the heart of Texas. So basically, that's a 5,000 square foot house done in Texas. That could not have been done anywhere else but Texas, because that's where it was. More or less. Well. Architecture practice says more is just wrong. I mean, you've got to distill it down to the essence of what's going on. Marketing says, well, you know, more is really good. If I can give you more and charge more, but actually it would be less costly, good deal. So I've got to give you the illusion that you're getting more. That is the definition of the McMansion. That is the definition of a Striver survey done in the year 2000 that the two largest values that new homeowners wanted and what they were shopping for was as big a house as possible as cheap a house as possible. And so you get big, cheap houses that have the illusion of being more. My reality is, we do big houses, we do small houses. I think what the reality about less or more is just right is relative. And the truth is, 
That's just right for this guy in Texas. God bless him. <laughs> size matters. Well, Arthur Drexler says, well, you know, size, this whole size thing, you know, inches, feet, why should we be limited by the actual size of anything when we're thinking about a building? We really should be thinking about shape and concept and idea. The marketing guys, the traditional guys, says, you know what? Size is more important than usefulness. You know, I really try to use that. This is a big effort. <coughs> You're going to really like this house. It's big. The truth is, size is reality. You can't escape it. This, you know, this house is a big, heinous house. And you can't change it from being a big, heinous house. Iconography. What is iconography? Well, iconography is just, you know, that's a clock because I know what a clock face looks like. You know, there's, there's a shoe because I know what a shoe looks like. And there's a fire extinguisher. These are icons in the world. These are things that we see every day. They're part of our visual literacy. They're part of our visual experience. How do we end up using that in the building? Well, basically for the architecture world, it's of the devil. We don't want any icons. We want to have something which is universal. I'm going to redesign this fire signature, so it looks like something I like. Whereas in marketing, iconography is a catalog. Oh, you want a, a growy faucet? Yes, you've got that. There it is. There's a growy faucet, and that's why I charge you $4,000 for a $500 faucet, because you wanted that icon, and I gave it to you, and I'm going to make some money off of it, and I'm going to market it. The reality is iconography is everywhere. You can't escape it. It never goes away. Like the house. It never goes away. Dollars. One of the things that I deal with every day as an architect. If you guys are architects and builders, you know dollars are the metronome and the meter of what happens in our culture. Architectural correctness, architects say, if you have to ask, you don't deserve it. If you have to ask the price tag, just, just get out of the room right now because what I do, what we do, is what you do, what you should have, and if you can't afford it, then you know, sorry. Marketing basically says cost is king and leverage is profit. If I can get the price down when you buy it, then I can cheapen it up and I can make money. So money is a vehicle for profit, and money is a vehicle for the architect. Value rules. I'm not going to show you the Texas house, so relax. <laughs> the truth is that this house, we did this the height of the building room, the absolute zenith of the building room. I think we did this house in 2006. We did this house after the original house burned down on the old foundation. We did this house for $115 a square foot, including design fees, with a GC in Connecticut. If you know how to build something, you can create value. If you make something that's kind of interesting and quirky and fun, laughing. This is maybe a duo thing. This is maybe something that most artists don't think about. But are we laughing at or with the people around us who use our houses uh, and build our houses? In architecture practice, basically the word, the word is humor is impertinent. It is basically a sign of intellectual immaturity. We need to be creative, and this is serious business. Humor in houses that are being marketed simply doesn't work. It's not profitable. Why would you pay for a joke? <laughs> Life without laughter is not worth the effort. So in my little world, my little reality, everything I do has got some sense of humor. When we realized that we were going to have a child who's actually sitting over there and is 22 years old and is not 23. We built an addition onto the house that I see you saw before. I thought this was going to be facing into the woods and no one would ever see it, so I made the screaming child facade. <laughs> Knowing that there would be, in this room right here, in this little window here, would be a crib and there would be a screaming child. <laughs> Unfortunately, we got more land, we built the house, and now we look at the screaming child facade from our barn of fun every day. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to show you is something I threw in, because I realized that part of the canon, part of the, of the culture of, of, of essentially dutiful and worshipful uh, adherence to some higher order in architecture is density. It's become this, uh, uh, almost a mantra that if something is dense, it is good. Urban is now good, suburban is bad. In marketing, in the traditional style, they really don't care. I'll, I'll sell you a condo, I'll sell you a house on 27 acres. Whatever it is, it's all good. The truth is that for me, density is a choice, not a canon. People want to live in Vermont and have a tiny house on a big plot of land. That is the way they want to live. And no matter what Corbusier drew, there were, there were the vast majority of American people don't really think they want to live in towers isolated from other people. I'm going to show you a transitional piece then that I hopefully will get out of here sooner than I, I'm afraid I might. 
Transitional piece. This is a this is a 17th century house in Madison, Connecticut, where I'm from. It was basically the probably the most iconic building that you could have, which is a cave. Uh, an architect named um, Albert Reese bought it in 1966. He had a young family, including a, a young woman who is now my client. And when he saw the house, he was inspired by the arch of the corner cover of the old dining room. And with variations, it was carried on through all the work. And he was an architect trained at Yale, trained in the classic architecture world. He saw this, and he repeated it in this wonderful kind of mid-century modernist abstraction, even to the point of these little archy things, these little bent pieces of wood. And, and he made this flat roof thing next to this peak roof thing. And it was celebrated in a bunch of national magazines and with a tiny little cool pod for a living room and a master suite with this entry thing in between. And this little tiny entry thing was quite cool and wonderful, but the truth is that this the, the married couple that inherited the house realized they couldn't live in it anymore. It had to expand maybe by 100 or 200 feet. They just couldn't deal with it anymore. I run into the equation that, you know, your dad made this house. You love this house. You grew up in this house. We're going to make it. We're going to make a new fulcrum for this house, which is the entry. How do you want it to be? She said, "Well, show me examples." So I showed her three or four different ways you could make a little entry. They themselves, without knowing their father's quote, chose this. They chose to pull this out and make this little icon. This thing that actually sheds water, sheds snow, and actually mediates between this and this with that little loopy thing. And it actually makes this little sculptural but architectural statement that allows you to see the context through. It allows this thing to float, just like this floats. And basically what it does is it carries materiality through and it draws your eye. And it makes something which spans icon and icon with zeitgeist. I took this fairly insane ramblings, illegally done in my car going to Massachusetts, and I took this to my editor at um, at Taunton, Peter Chapman, the best editor in America, I think. And he just said, oh, you're so full of shit. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you've got to make this something that somebody could, could actually deal with. And I said, well, I thought about this. Said, what about something called free-range homes? What about homes that are not tethered by mod or trap that just actually do what they do? Because I, there are a bunch of my homies out there, myself included, that are actually factually busier than we've ever been in the worst recession, in the history of recession of an Arctic. For 32 years, I have more work in my office than I've ever had. There are a bunch of other people out there. I'll show you them a little bit later. But these are the sort of houses we're doing. These are houses that are incredibly determined by zoning. Setbacks, septic setbacks, wetland setbacks, total coverage, totally maxed out. And it creates a shape which is interesting, but it also creates an architecture which is fits, but doesn't fit. Which expresses things, and at the same time, allows things to spontaneously erupt which makes spaces like these outdoor indoor spaces, which are the one time universal, but at the same time grounded in real materiality. It allows details to happen that are functional and structural and expressed, but at the same time are creative and interesting. It actually creates things like Bilco doors that don't leak but are made out of wood because you think about where the water drips off the facade. It makes entries like this and trim like this, which allows things to become Inverted allows standard stuff to happen with custom stuff, that allows blank to happen with texture, that allows contrast, that allows you to be beckoned in by the one curve in the house and then covered by it and embraced by it. It allows this house that we visited yes was it yesterday, Liz? We lived in this house, was yeah. it yesterday? I'd never seen this house. I did this is a house that was burned down. They had to replace the house that was burned down in Martha's Vineyard. They had so little money that they couldn't afford me to ever go to Martha's Vineyard. We figured out that after one design was rejected by the zoning board, that if we had this E too low to use from the inside, we could have this peak too high that we could actually use a law from, from the inside. So we created this house that essentially plays with the eaves and makes space where it can to get the low point and the high point min and max. The house could only be exactly as big as the old house was because the entire house was in the floodplain and the lot was deemed to be unbuildable unless there was a house there and their house was burned down. They didn't want a new house, the house went away. So we figured out a way to make beds get to the two low places. We figured out a way to make the tallness that we get and make views that were outside, so a little 1,000 square foot house. We made, we made views in, visible from inside, make mullions that actually resisted wind loads, and made this sort of not swampy but quite wet place a place that you could actually look at salt water, which is a big deal in my Now, this is a house, also in the water, 
that for about five minutes was almost a record house in 2012. I know this because I'm a mole in the, in the editorial offices. And when I said him this, and I with this sense of classic humor and irony, I said, this doesn't stand a chance, does it? He said, well, wait a minute. I asked him two weeks later, what the has happened? And he goes, well, if it makes you feel any better, it caused a lot of argument. <laughs> because it was a house that was iconic, had an interesting shape to it, because we actually bent it to meet the actual real view versus the incredibly tight sight lines. It's a house that actually has outdoor places, and private places, and very public and outside spaces. It thinks about how to shade yourself from the southern sun. It, allows, it thinks about how you vent through this actual functional venting cupola. It actually figures out how I can get the maximum insulation and minimum envelope in this, in this very sort of weather-worn place. It has fun with, with, with dealing with traditional things and untraditional things. It's in a house that's incredibly alive because the owners are incredibly alive. It deals with stucco, it deals with salvaged 100-year-old uh, uh, redwood, it deals with brand new cedar clapboards. Everything is essentially unfinished. Nothing needs painting. Everything is a forever finish. In the back, it opens up to the water with this, with this uh, great view. It basically allows a little bit of, of, of place to sit outside, a little place inside, and you all the zone requirements. Mm. Uh, these all bent. This this was actually was going to be more architecty, and they basically said, no, we want to have fun. So we basically made a pair of top, we made this vault over. This is a bazillion dollar sewn top. But the truth is those poles cost eleven dollars each and were custom made by a guy who likes to bend stainless steel. The stair is in, incredibly expensive for tread, but it's only one one wide, so it's not curved itself. We made this, this floor to get light down to backlight that incredibly bright south wall. We then bent everything up through, up through, up through, so that they, that vents the warm out. And this actually serves as a return to the top of the gap here for the HVAC system, and actually a fly down below. So we can actually manage the air in a micromanaged way. And we still get incredible views in tiny bedrooms, and we make infinite views of the outdoor space. Those are Paolo Bay planks salvaged from the uh, walkway on Coney Island, and they're probably were, were built about 90, 80, 90 years ago, and are so thick and strong they can span from here to here with no structure underneath them, and they allow the water to flow through. This is a house that's not quite finished yet in Connecticut, which has had a tiny, tiny site, so we ended up having like a four-story house, so tiny that we had to put the wine cellar under the steps. We, this, is, this is the absolute max, max of height, width, and everything we can make. The owners built this over three or four years and basically are childless and want to have party after party after party. So this is basically a party house that has a lot of exciting, fun things that go on in it. And basically we bring the outside in. We basically make interesting undersides to things. We basically make a sleeping porch that has glass down here and screen here so the dogs can't run through. He actually measured where his ladder could reach to clean the glass, so don't worry about that. The owner spent $27,000 four years ago in an online auction and bought a lot of silage lumber and almost got divorced. All that wood, with the exception of 4,000 board feet, is now used in the house everywhere you can possibly see, and I saved his marriage, um, including doing this fun little thing here, whatever that is. We're in the middle of making a house now, which basically says, well, People wanted a sort of traditional house, but they're not traditional people, so we just had a blast making a million different ways to do windows and trim. Another house, same idea. Very difficult site getting up to the water. How do we make a place that builds in a potential elevator for the future, gets in its tiny, so we had to have a driveway because these are older people, to get cars in to be protected. How do we make that fun, spontaneous, and handle the iconic salvaged front door that they got on the internet for 800 dollars Everything here sheds water. This is all ice I trim. Nothing's going to be coated. Nothing's going to be finished. It should last a long time without any maintenance. And this house should be in California. It's taken again several years because people are taking several years. And it basically has one very sweepy idea, a very fun idea, but also brings in traditional things but uses them in very spontaneous, interesting, evocative, fun ways. Including the icon that the owner wanted a Belvedere roof somewhere in the house. And we can accommodate that. <laughs> All this stone is local. We're doing a house right now on a lake in Connecticut. So let me show you, because I know time is short and so am I. Which I'm probably not that short. But anyway, um, the, the, what other architects are doing. This is John DeForest in Seattle, who takes very normative stuff like this, turns it into this, which is you know, mod, but at the same time has eaves, has salvage materials, opens up to views, and he's busier than he's ever been. 
This, this is Jim Estes, who some of you might know from outside of Boston, who has houses that are both ironic, funny, humorous, and incredibly beautiful. He doesn't mind having a thing like a barn door at the front of my house. It's an icon. It's been, it's been around for a long time. But so what that it's an icon? It's actually very beautiful. He makes compositional things, but he also makes ironic things, like putting an Eve in front of a big window. This is, J uh, this is Michael Imber from Texas, who says, well, yeah, I, I, I like the idiom, but I like the idiom in a way that I can manipulate it and sell it and do interesting things. I can make trim into shapes. I can make stone become plastic. And you guys, and you guys, you guys from way back when, <laughs> that, that, used, that used humor, that used materiality, that used commentary, that used spontaneity, that used things to make architecture. Architecture that is not predictable. Architecture that doesn't live by canons. Architecture that is spontaneous, humorous, ironic, of the zeitgeist is part of the way we live. Architecture that may not be permanent, but architecture that has commentary. Thank you for having me.